feel very lucky and blessed to have been in Detroit in those early days. The location has a lot to do with who we are and what we become. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, right across the border. And I was really lucky that when I was about 16 or 17, I was one of the Windsor kids who wanted to go to Detroit, wanted to search for more. And that search led me to music that was actually coming from Detroit. The early Detroit techno, Juan Atkins, Derek May, Kevin Saunderson, Eddie Folks, all these guys. It was always about mutating and ripping something apart and putting it back together in a new way. It was always looking forward. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, most of us were buying used synthesizers, you know, from the pawn shops. They very rarely came with a manual. You get a DX100 or DX7 without a manual. I think that was part of the fascination also. You know, it wasn't like you could go on the internet and, you know, download the manual. You really couldn't call up any friends to say, well, how do you do this? You just kind of, you know, watch some people here and there. I used to go to Derek May's house and Kevin Saunderson studio, KMS, and I'd just kind of be like, if I was there for one minute or five minutes or one hour, I'd just be watching and sucking it in. And what, what are people doing on a mixing console? I didn't know what a mixing console was. You know, I didn't know what an EQ was. It was just slowly practicing and trying to approximate what I was hearing on the radio, on Jeff's shows, on the records. You have all these sounds that you kind of like, and then you try to start figuring out, okay, well, is that a 909 drum machine or is that an EQ? I remember when my partner at the time, John Aquaviva, said, come to my studio, I've got lots of stuff you're gonna like. And he said, check that machine out over there, TRR 909. And I turned it on and it was like listening to every Derek May record I'd ever heard. And it was like, that's the sounds I've been looking for. And then it's, okay, well, can I make a Derek May record? And somewhere along the line, Rich make, trying to make a Derek May record became Rich making his own record. So the machines that I love now even, the textures of sound, weren't something that I even kind of had a choice about. Like I love Dave Smith instruments because in the beginning I had a Pro One, a sequential six track, and I just use them all the time. Same with the Roland 101 and 202, 303, 808, 909, 707, 727. This is stuff that I found. And that just became my sound. I couldn't afford a Moog. And it wasn't until years, like a couple of years ago, that I got a Moog. And I love the sound. But when I'm very honest, other people use a Moog much better than me because they've spent time and that's their sound. Because I didn't have it in my formative years, I can sit on that kind of instrument for hours and love it. But it's harder for me to put that kind of frequency range because of course a Moog has a frequency and a Roland has a frequency and a Quark has a frequency and a sequential circuits have a frequency. And the ones that I've been used to manipulating and using in those early years are still kind of the ones I go back to now. That all goes back down to being an artist. You know, for me, Dave Smith is an artist. Bob Moog was an artist. We all hear things differently. It's not that's better or, or, or that's worse. It's just like, I resonate with those frequencies over there. So it all really makes sense. It's all about frequencies and resonating and, and finding a vibration that's real and honest and you. I chose to go the computer route in late 1999 when Final Scratch first came out. When I heard that there was a software that you could use and connect to turntables to control MP3s and digital files, it was a revelation for me. At that time, I was doing shows called Dex FX 909, and I had the drum machine and effects, and I was layering, and it was another way to mutate and manipulate on another level. From Final Scratch, I went to Traktor. The ability to add effects going from two decks to four decks, to routing in the computer, then adding Ableton for effects. All this was just giving me more ways to create spontaneously. To me, there's always been a strong connection between DJing and, and production. I think that's why I still love handhold grabbing things and manipulating. My studio work, of course, is programming drum machines and setting up 
a number of rhythms and then leaving all the machines and the computers all running and jamming on the mixing console and those machines nearly in a dub kind of style. And when I'm DJing, it's also that kind of stream of consciousness. I do preparation by going through all the records and tracks that are sent to me or the records that I would have bought back in the day. Then just going with the flow, playing the first record and maybe I know the second record. But after that, you never really know. It's a flow, it's intuitive, and it's a feeling that you just have to let naturally evolve. You know, I have Ableton going, I have Tractor, I have thousands of records, I have certain drum sounds in my push that I've decided I like to use. So I, I guess I have all the sounds and the frequencies in place, but push and Ableton start empty. My record box basically starts empty. As a DJ, I want to take songs apart and repurpose them and allow people to hear things in a completely new way. I want to wrap people up in frequencies and you know, have it like a warm blanket that maybe gets too tight at some points and then releases you and takes you on this journey and has you walking out the end of the night thinking, you know, what were those records? What just happened to me?